we have uh, Bruce Deng and uh, Peter Ferry in spirit, um, who will uh, tell us about uh, Microsoft's efforts uh, at uh, analyzing Stuxnet. Take it away, Bruce. Big hand, please. Yeah, so before I start, um, I don't want to say anything about the Mossad. Uh, but yeah, we, we had the running joke. Uh, so like a few days, I heard some like, Iranian scientist got killed in a drive-by. Uh, Peter would talk to me, and then like, he's like, oh, man, I got to go. Uh, somebody so he, dis he got disconnected from the network. Then he disappeared for a week, and I, I didn't know what happened. And then uh, he came back, like, oh, yeah, Bruce, I was walking on the sidewalk. I got hit by a car. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So, anyways, um, so yeah, so, but uh, Peter, so a lot of this, so uh, all this stuff, all this content here, the mistakes are mine, not Peter. So, if there's something wrong, blame me, not Peter. Uh, so, anyways, I'll start. So, uh, the, one of the reasons for this talk is uh, we actually planned this talk, uh, I planned this with Felix a few months ago. Uh, and at the time, there weren't that many publications about Stuxnet, of all the different volumes and so on. Task scheduler uh, didn't get fixed yet, uh, so we were planning to like hey, this would be like the first time where we talk about this. So this is the reason. Uh, and the other one is uh, we actually analyzed our team analyzed this uh, Stuxnet malware like within the first few weeks when it came in, but we weren't allowed to talk about it for very obvious reasons until now. I think this is like the first time where I'm allowed to talk about this kind of stuff. So. Um, and the other uh, reason why is uh, we want to share instead of sharing you know all of this data blah 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 stuff. I'm gonna talk about how we actually analyze it, like the, the process that we went through, you know, how we, uh, how we f identified the vulnerabilities, how they were fixed, and the different people involved, and so on. So it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, so anyways, with that, I'll continue on. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about the, how we, uh, so the two important, you guys know what Stuxnet is, right? So I don't have to sit here and explain. Uh, so the two, uh, to me, there are two aspects of Stuxnet that were um, interesting. One uh, was the, the fact that it used four zero-day vulnerabilities, and the second part was the SCADA uh, component. Uh, I am not a SCADA expert. I don't actually don't know anything about SCADA, so I'm not going to talk about that here. Peter did some stuff on it, but he's not here. So, uh, And then if we have some time at the end, I'm going to talk about how uh, we decompiled uh, cert, uh, some components of Stuxnet. Um, Rolf Rolls and I actually decompiled two components back to compi like, compilable C code, and like, we're pretty confident it's uh, like nearly identical to the original source code because when we compile it, the opcodes match up like, I don't know, like 80 something percent. So, uh, when, uh, but if we, yeah, that's only if we have enough time. And then at the end, I'll talk about the lessons learned, like what went wrong and what, how I could have learned this, uh, how I could have analyzed this faster. All right, so the prologue, to set the background for this, um, I don't remember what day this was, but it's somewhere in July. This uh, one day, this company, uh, this is an uh, called Virus Block uh, ADA. Uh, they're a small AV vendor in Belarus. Uh, I've actually, actually never heard of them. They sent us, uh, they found the malware and they sent us a PDF doing some initial triage. And the, the PDF talked about, uh, they show a screenshot which was then, uh, had some redacted, you know, like there's a screenshot and there's like black spots there. And they're talking about the potential Windows Zero Day using LNK files. Uh, and then um, later, we didn't get the sample and then some guy from the AV test company sent them to us. And then at the, the time, there were also dis discussions on various internal mailing lists. Uh, people talking, oh, is this some new Windows Zero Day? People were not quite sure yet. So, and then uh, after we got the sample, the uh, case manager actually uh, opened a case and they came to our office and asked, hey, you know, people are talking about this. It uh, seems like this is a pretty big deal. Can, we, uh, can you guys take a look at it? And at first, you know, the way he described the vulnerability, it says, oh, you know, auto run through link files, blah, 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 blah. So at the time we thought, okay, well, just another auto run vault. Like, why do we need to take a look at this, right? Um, and uh, but at the end we, uh, we we said, okay, fine, we'll take a look at it. And it's a good thing that we did. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how <clears throat> I'm gonna go. So there are four vaults. I'm gonna talk about how we find each one of them and the techniques we use to find them. Okay. So the first thing, some more background. So you gotta remember that when this came in. Uh, there's a lot of pr there were a lot of press uh, uh, talks, I guess, about this. People they didn't know that there were volunteers there, but there were like a lot of press attention. Uh, there were, we knew that there were other companies looking at this. We knew Symantec, McAfee, and pretty much all the AV vendors, all the other security companies were looking at this. Um, and uh, we it was important for, for our team that we need to know all the different. Uh, let me take this back a bit further. 
At the time, we did not know that there were four volumes in there. We knew there was only one volume, which is the LNK one. We didn't know there were, there were three more. Um, but we knew that other people were looking at it. And so it was important for us to know, you know the details of the volumes, if any, before the other companies. Knowing first is pretty important to us because uh, then we can talk, tell our customers about them. Uh, we don't get money by publishing our results, so unlike other companies. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. And uh, another thing you got to keep in mind is Stuxnet is about a mag of code, like in binary form. So that's actually, you know, it's not, you know, some people might think, oh, a mag is nothing. Well, actually analyzing one mag of binary code is a bit, and uh, not knowing what you're looking for. So, um, and we have had a very short amount of time to do this, because people were always, uh, management were always constantly coming by asking us, okay, well, you know, are there updates to this? Because the press requests, blah, 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 blah. So, and another thing is, uh, when we're investigating this, there were a lot of, uh, like, expertise required, because the, these volumes happen in different components in Shell and Win3K.sys, and it, although, you know, we have really smart people on our team, no one knows everything, so we need help from other people. So it's like a team effort, pretty much. So these are the facts, you know, keep these facts in mind. Like, timing is really, really important. And also, you don't know what you're looking for. I mean, it's like all black box, right? All right, so the, the trick that we, uh, we came up with was we divided, when this miner came in, we divided the task into two, uh, two, uh, two people. One was Peter Ferry, and one was uh, the other person's me. And the way we did it, uh, the, we were assigned to, uh, basically they told us, okay, stop, work, stop working on whatever you're working on, like spend full time on this. And the objective was that not to understand everything from the beginning to the end, but basically to identify suspicious um, blocks of code that maybe relate to vulnerabilities, and then isolate them and like, try to understand them as soon as possible, and then pass that knowledge to the developer so that you know, like, they can figure stuff out. Um, and like, understanding every minute details is not important to us, because that's like, almost like a, not a waste of time, but it's, it wasn't important to our team at the time. Uh, and then the other uh, thing is that, uh, so the developers, developers, most of them, you know, they don't read assembly code every single day, right? But they do know how the components they own, they do know how it works and so on. So we need to take, you know, transfer our reverse engineering knowledge to them. They can use that to, like, you know, try to figure out what the vuln is and vice versa. So, all right. So bug number one, this is, uh, so this is what we got. This is actually an unredacted uh, version. Uh, so this is the file that we got from uh, the sample. This, this is a link file. If you notice, there is uh, like a path, it's like a .tmp blah 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 path. So, this, so the first thing we, we saw, we looked at this file, we said, like, okay, well, the link, link file is, is a binary file format. This is like when you right click and create a shortcut, uh, you create a link file. Uh, so the first thing we did was, we converted the link, in order to figure out what the vuln is for this, we knew that like, you know, the path, you know, somehow, uh, the path to the file is somehow, you know, not valid properly, but we didn't know where that was happening. So the first thing we did was we dumped the contents of the LNK file into human parsable form. So you know all the different fields and so on. And then so we dumped it, and then here at the end, uh, the path name is the CP1 name. It's actually like a structure, uh, a field inside a, a structure in the LNK file. So this is a path. Uh, normally you, you would see C dollar, uh, sorry, C colon WAC blah dot, you know C WAC, sorry C colon WAC window system32 blah. But here they use a different, uh, uh, a different format. But this path is basically, uh, you can use this path as well. This path is uh, used for uh, removable devices. For this one is for specific to a Kingston USB device. So the original uh, sample came from, a, like a, I guess, a USB, uh, Kingston USB stick. Um, so we knew from the behavior, of the, the, like from the description that people were, de were describing, we knew that the DLL that's, that's specified, you know, like this file here is a DLL. We knew that was somehow being loaded into the, uh, the export.exe. Uh, but we didn't actually quite know, you know all the details at that point. So what, it, what we did was we just, set, uh, we just tell the debugger, hey, notify me when this DOL is loaded. And then, so the, the, then, then when the DOL is loaded, the, current, the debugger breaks in, and we, get a, we got a stack trace. And then from the stack trace, we figured out, okay, well, blah, it's like pretty simple. We know where the vuln is. And this took, like, I don't know, like two or three minutes. Um, remember, like, so when we, had this, when we opened this case, there were, I don't know, probably like 20, 30 people involved, and emails were being exchanged back and forth literally like every two or three minutes probably. Uh, like, and then, so the root cause is basically uh, LNK files contain uh, li uh, uh, links uh, to a, a target, right? Uh, shell needs to know the icon to represent this uh, shortcut. And control panel links, which is a special type of link file, has a property called dynamic icons. And in order for the shell to get the icons, what they do is they literally call load library on this. And when you, you know, anybody who programs Windows, load library, when you pass it, uh, it will execute DLL main automatically. So the, the end result is that 
uh, you get code running like in the current user uh, context like automatically. Um, so the code path, this is uh, that's actually so this is the top the top this is actually a stack trace. The top function here is that's actually where a call to low library, and the bottom is all the functions that led to it. And, the re and I'm not showing the source code. I'm actually not going to show any. I'm not going to show any source code for any of these volumes because these volumes are so simple to understand that like having source code is just, just like it doesn't even matter. So anyway, so literally here with this volume, you get to load library any file you want. Okay, any uh, then the file can be located anywhere. Uh, the attack vectors. Okay, so once we figure out the volume, okay, well, uh, looks like uh, the shell doesn't validate uh, where the DL is being loaded from to get the icons. So, okay, but that was like, you know, we, the one we made a repro with C dollar, you know, C, do, C colon windows, I mean, C colon temp blah dot DLL. But we were wondering, okay, well, usually uh, web dev, what, about, like, what if you put it, the, the DLL in a UNC share on the internet or something like that? Would this work? And that was important to us because and that basically means that you can exploit this, uh, you can put your file on the internet and, you know, you can destroy the world. Uh, so we, uh, it turns out that uh, we were able to create uh, a repro that, um, uses WebDAV, where the DLL is not stored on the local drive, it's stored somewhere on the internet. And when we found this out, it's like, wow, dude, it's like, like really bad stuff. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and when, then, so, of course, at the time, once we figure out, okay, all the different attack vectors, we know, okay, this is really bad, we need to, uh, like, act very fast, and of course, at the same time, there are, like, you know, management asking, okay, what are we going to do, blah, 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 blah. Of course, like, once we figure out the, once we figure out the root cause, like, literally about a minute or two after that, the fix was, rec there was somebody recommended a fix. So the initial uh, proposal for the fix is, okay, well, uh, force it so that DL the, the, the DLLs will can only be loaded from C Windows System 32, which requires you know, admin to write to it first, right? Uh, it seems kind of obvious. Uh, but then the shell developer said, no, that uh, actually we shouldn't do that because that goes against our public guidance to people. Uh, we tell people, hey, you know, don't put your control panel files in, uh, like in the C -S -S Windows System uh, 32 directory, put it somewhere else. So uh, if we were to, you know, put it, we, we, we had the first fix, then that would break a lot of third-party developer stuff, and that's like bad news, and we don't want to do that. So the final fix is actually um, different. We, we, we make sure that the applet, the control panel applet, is registered before we load the dynamic icons. So, uh, and lo re so yeah, so that's how we, we fix that one. Um, and of course, again, this happens literally within minutes after we figure out the root cause. Um, and I think the fix was implemented pretty, uh, this one we went out of band. So it was, yeah, so the, they built uh, the final binary like, pretty quickly. So uh, from the attacker perspective, like what the hell is this used for? Because all you can, with this volume, all you can do is you can only get, um, you can get code running, but code running only in the current user context. So you're not able to load a driver or anything else. Um, so it seems kind of useless, but it's actually not true. Uh, because uh, what is this used for? This is used for to gain an initial, um, I guess like a uh, footstep on the computer that you need, that you need on, your, on the target computer. Um, and again, uh, you, you gotta, one thing you gotta remember is like, this is 100% reliable. There's no quote unquote, you know, like memory corruption here. So it will be successful 100% of the time. Uh, and anyways, uh, so this moment, uh, after we, we you know, release a fix and stuff like that, uh, we did some further investigation. It turns out this moment was known for s several years by various people. Um, but of course, nobody told me about that. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So and then so this is the one that we uh, we actually went out of band. This is within like two weeks, I think, went out of band. And the reason why we went out of band is because once our team figured out the implications of this bug and how horrible it is, it's like holy crap, man! Like we need to go on, like immediately. Uh, but of course, out of band is very expensive, and you need to calculate. You know, you, there are many factors that add in. It's, it's extremely expensive. I don't know what the figure is, but it's like you know, like way more than my salary. Um, and so we have to think about it pretty, you know, like carefully. Uh, and we also look at uh, some of the telemetry data, uh, you know, how we had, you know, some signatures being deployed for this particular vulnerability. We found that there are a lot of people being affected by this. So at the end, we decided to, like, to go out of band. And of course, you know, Metasploit added, uh, had an export for this, so, like, you know, like seven-year-olds can exploit people. So it's pretty simple, so it's bad news. So that's how we went, that's why we went out of band. The interesting fact is, for this one, there was no reverse engineering required, right? Because we just had the LNK file and we knew what was going on. So there's like everything I just explained to you here happened within about one hour after we released a sample, you know, setting up emails and adding the right people and so on. Um, all right. So 